Good evening, Kentucky. Mm, I don't know. Good evening, Kentucky. All right. Hey, y'all. I knew you'd understand that one. I'm from North Carolina. That's what we do. Hey, y'all. You ready to sing? Ah. You, re you really ready to sing? Okay. So here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to stand. And everywhere we go, we say we stand together simply because we stand together. Now, if you're not able to stand, designate somebody to stand for you. If you're really not able to stand. Now, normally, we're close enough that we can feel each other's energy because we like to create in this moment what Dr. Wyatt T. Walker called collective identity and collective effervescence. And that's the energy that happens when we all get together and start singing justice music, right? Okay, so this is Marielle on the other mic. And here's how we're gonna start. We're gonna start by just testing the room, by just feeling the room out a little bit, okay? If I get too close to this, y'all say, go back. <laughs> All right? So without music, I want you to sing this. Let love arise. Let love arise. And its enemies be scattered. And its enemies be scattered. Let love Arise, and its enemies be scattered. Let love arise, and its enemies be scattered. Let love, let love, let love, let love arise. arise, let love arise, and its enemies be scattered, let love arise, and its enemies be scattered, let
Give somebody a fist bump and say it's all about love. And when we have love, now this is where you're really gonna shine. This is where I'm gonna hear all these voices from the back. How many baritones are in here? Bass baritones. Okay, they raised their hand halfway up. How many tenors, altos, sopranos? I don't have a clue. <laughs> we, what I'm always scared of is if they raise their hands back here. <laughs> All right, let's do this little light of mine. How about that, Marielle? You want to start that off?
Okay, here we go, right here in the middle. Yeah, this little light of mine. national call for we're in the poor people's campaign we're in the and we have a song that says and before this campaign failed where are we going if we have to before this campaign failed we'll all go down to jail because everybody's got a right to live. You believe that? Yeah, yeah. So this is the last song and we're gonna lift this one nice and high. So those are the words. Everybody's got a right to live. Everybody's got a right to live. And before this campaign fails, we'll all go down to jail because everybody's got a right to live. Okay? Are we ready? We're gonna let the bass man start us off with this one. Give it up for the bass man. Give it up for the band. Okay? Mm hmm We'll all go down to jail Cause everybody's got a right to live Everybody's got a right to live Everybody's got a right to live And before this campaign fails We'll all go down to 
jail Everybody's got a right to Let me hear you sing it Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now that's good. That's real good. But let me tell you where the energy of this song lives. The energy lives in the stomp, clap, stomp, clap, stomp, clap, stomp, clap. Right? So we were pretty cool. We were thinking about going to jail that time. This time we're going to be committed. Okay? So let's try it again. Drummer, give us a beat. Okay? We're going to pick it up just a little. All right. Everybody's got a right to live. Everybody's got a right to live. And before this campaign fails, we'll all go down to jail. Everybody's got a right to Everybody's got a right to love. in this with what we started with, okay? Let love arise. We, we want to book in that. <sighs> Come on. Let love arise and its enemies be scattered. Let love arise and its enemies be scattered. Let love to put some energy behind that. Let love
We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential, but I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus, because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter's Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast and she wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one should have to bury their child in America because they don't have health care insurance. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of back-breaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sisters. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone with the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Now I'm also a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide at a far greater rate than the national average. Why? Because they're stressed out. They're stressed out. They're usually in debt up to their eyeballs because they can't pay for all the equipment that it takes to run a farm. And they're usually, they're in the most dangerous line of work there is, yet they, many can't afford to buy health insurance. We have no hospital. We are in a food desert. We have one grocery store for the whole county. Our neighbor, my husband's uncle, still drinks pond water self-treated with chlorine. He had to have a kidney removed at age 64. And the year before that, his wife died of some unknown cancer. Hi, my name is Pamela Roche. I'm from Niles County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. And I got raw sewage. I don't have no, no money on power. And I had to travel back and forth to buy my hand to f take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have my car and don't have no way to, to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about 1,000 people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, we were all shut off for the day because none of us could afford our water bills. In the past, my family wasn't able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on all of us. But the indigenous people in the surrounding communities that are being affected, we talk about health care. We talk about worrying about the environment. But yet, when they're allowing open pit mines and um, letting it leak into the land, into the water, the high rate of cancer and the high bills of health is going to continue to raise because of corporations and greeds and politicians that don't want to listen. There's a new chemical company that's producing another carcinogen. In our community, it's amazing. The people who uh, just started dying of cancer. And when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, I was amazed at the black women that would ring our doorbell and walk in the door and pull a wig off to show my wife that I have it too. 
this wall. This is sin of the highest order. I put my life on the line at 17 years old to uh, defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And right now what we have, we have domestic enemy right here. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say this is not right. Somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the streets. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. Our backs are against the wall and we got no choice but to push. <laughs> We lift our voices for justice. We put our bodies on the line for mercy. And together we will proclaim liberty throughout the land for the enslaved, for the poor, and for us all. Yeah. All of that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the East Coast. Two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west coast, a wave, and the historians tell us it's never happened before. Our communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign, you can count on us. Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. Second warning. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls. No one is listening. So we gotta make our, find a way to make ourselves heard. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we are here. We are poor. We are clergy. And we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court in this land, that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to living wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in the society. Everybody say, oh! I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. and their clergy. We read Article 6 of the Kentucky State Constitution okay. that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. We demand the right to vote. The right to vote. Before we need to cease and desist immediately or you'll be arrested. There will be a movement that will break through the con and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. Kentucky, repeat after me. Somebody is, is hurting our communities, and it's gone on Far too, Far too long. And we won't, touch yourself, and we won't be silent anymore. Can y'all cut the lights up for me? Because I want the world to see Kentucky say that. Kentucky and Ohio and Indiana, we need to say that for the nation to hear us. Somebody, Somebody is hurting our people. what we just presented on this video 
And I know it's a lot of things happening right here in Kentucky. Am I right about it? Amen. Ohio, am I right about it? Amen. Indiana, am I right about it? Amen. And so tonight we're here for war. We're here for business. Because we know that for too long our nation has been quiet about the needs of the poor and dispossessed. Oh, but I believe we came here tonight in Kentucky and Covington to say no more. I said no more. And we're going to raise our voices and we're going to raise our balance and we're going to do what we got to do to make justice serve for all people. My name is Reverend Erica Williams. I'm one of the national organizers for the Poor People's Campaign, and I will be your MC for tonight. And I'm an old country Baptist preacher. So y'all better come along with us tonight. Because we didn't come out here tonight just to play. We came to hear from the very important people, I call them the VIPs in our society, to put a face to these injustices. Because y'all got Mitch McConnell here as y'all sitting and he up there don't want to let nobody really know what's going on. But I got some Kentuckians in here tonight that say we know the deal. And we gonna make it be heard. So tonight I want you to engage with us. I hope you're sharing on social media. Please share the live stream. The Kentuckys for Commonwealth. What is it? The um, Northern Kentucky? Yes, for the Commonwealth. Kentuckians for the Commonwealth have the live stream up. Please go on your page and share it. You ought to tell folks you should have been here tonight. But even if you're not here tonight, they can text 90975 to sign up for the campaign and to get involved. We need 90975, that's the number to text, to join the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. So y'all be organizers tonight. While you sitting here, start sending it out all across the social media. How many of y'all on social media? As my grandma called it, y'all know Facebook? Instagram and Twitter. Tweet, tweet it, okay? So right now we're gonna have you have come to us. We have the Reverend Tracy Siegman, who's gonna come and give us a welcome, who is our host pastor for tonight. Then we'll have a land acknowledgement by Mr. Guy Jones, because y'all know in this country, we can't talk about nothing if we don't talk about the land that was stolen. We gotta make that story known. And then we'll have an opening prayer by Reverend Cara K. Colby. Let's put our hands together for them. I'm Pastor Tracy Sigman. I'm the senior pastor at First Christian Church Disciples of Christ here in Covington, Kentucky. Yeah! yeah. I want to welcome you this evening on behalf of the Northern Kentucky Coordinating Committee of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We have been organizing together for less than a year. And we are so excited to invite, uh, welcome the Moore Tour here to stop in Covington. We as a local coordinating committee are bringing the work of the Poor People's Campaign to this area because we have all seen or experienced segregation in our communities and we have worked in broken systems that fail the people they were started to help. The works of the campaign fuses the evils of systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, ecological devastation and the nation's distorted moral narrative which work together to oppress our people. The campaign sheds light on the impact of these five evils. We as a coordinating committee work together because we hear the call to act against injustice as a hope to envision and create a new world. I hope tonight that you hear testimonies and stories that will inspire you to do more. Raise that up a little bit. I'm a little bit taller than most people back here. You know, it's, um, when I got the call and I said, Guy, we want you to do a land acknowledgement. And I said, what? I had to think about it. And I mean, you know, but because we are at that point that so many people today fail to acknowledge the fact or even recognize the fact that there was people here long before y'all. I mean, me and my brother Jerry, we were standing here and they said, well, we need diversity 
And Jerry says, we got diversity. I said, yeah, we do. I said, there's me and you and all these immigrants. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the things that, you know, so many of us today, we forget that fact. And it's time to remind people. And I was excited because they said, Reverend Barber, and this is a moral revival. I was like, all right. <laughs> it's about time because you see, we live in a universe that is morally right. If we only acknowledge the existence of the Creator. If we acknowledge that existence of the Creator, then we begin to recognize ourselves. And once we begin to recognize ourselves, then and only then we will, will we truly see that God exists within all of us and that we are all God's children. We want to acknowledge the presence of the people whose land you walk on. It is the hope and awareness can and will create a commitment to the people of the land. The Osage, the Miami, the Shawnee, whose land was taken from them during the Indian Removal Act of 1833. We have a responsibility to acknowledge the history of colonialism. Because you see, your America, what has it given us? It has given us disease, poverty, suicides, and empty promises of a better tomorrow. I pray that God forgives you. Thank you. My name is Reverend Kara K. Skaggs Cavalli. If you will, please pray with me in whichever way that you pray. Amen? Amen? God of many names, who reveals yourself to us in so many faces and voices, God, thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. Thank you for uniting us through the movement of the Poor People's Campaign. We are here to demand your justice be done through the implementation of our moral agenda. God, we call all people of conscience to engage deeply in moral civic engagement and voting that cares about poor and low wealth people, the sick, the migrant, the workers, the environment, people with disabilities, the LGBTQAI community, and peace over war. God, we are here to shine a light on the conditions of those most impacted by racism and poverty and ecological devastation and militarization and the disordered moral narrative of rigid religious nationalism. God, give us strength. God, give us courage. Help us speak truth to power. Open the hearts of those that have been hardened to hear the voices of your people. God, may we be inspired by those speaking tonight. May we lift them up. May we shine a light on their story so all people may know their circumstance. We pray, Holy One, for your protection. Be with us and guide us through all things. And in my tradition, we say Christ Jesus, but in all traditions, we look to you, Holy One, and say amen. amen. Can we take that in for a moment? that we recognize that we are on stolen land and that we must always pay homage to the people who was here first. So we do honor our native sisters and brothers and we are grateful, grateful, grateful. 
I love this. Uh, Winsler from Arizona always say, before we get to the second chapter, we have to tell the first one. At this time, we're going to have come one of the women who I know who is the real deal, who has been doing this work for over 20, over 30 years, all my life and who is deeply committed to not just doing another thing and not doing charity and not just creating something to say I created something, but who wants to end poverty now. And that is the person and the spirit and the beauty of Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. She is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. She is gonna come at this time and she's gonna tell us about why we must do more now. So I know we don't usually like to clap for folks, but this is one of my sheroes. Because I know this woman has given her very all. I've seen it. And so we're honored to have her here with us tonight to share with us about why we must do more now. Reverend Dr. Lee, it's come. Good evening. Good evening, Covington. Good evening, Good evening Kentucky. Good evening. Good evening, Ohio. Good evening, Good evening Indiana. Good evening, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival all across this country. So I was noticing, maybe I have a, a particular perspective because I was sitting up here, all of the powerful freedom fighters that are on these paintings that are here with us this evening. I wanted folks to just take that in and know that their spirits, their lives are here with us as we try to take some of the next miles, some of the next steps, steps made possible because of the fights that these leaders have made. And I wanted to take a minute and bring some other people into the room. Folks that have gone on in our lives, in these struggles that we're a part of, people who have died because of poverty, whose lives have been shortened because of racism, who are barely able to breathe because of pollution and ecological devastation, whose kids have been killed because of the militarization of our communities, and the prioritization of military over human beings. And if you want to, say some of those people's names. Bring them into this gathering with us. Ron Casanova. Can you feel them? Do you know that they're here with us? Their spirits, what they stood for, and why we must do more. We have a saying in the Poor People's Campaign that when we lift from the bottom, when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. Will you say that with me? When we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. When we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. This evening, we're here in this very place to rise up. We're here to demonstrate the power 
that poor and impacted people have when we band together, how we can change this nation for the better. We're here to call for a radical redistribution of political and economic power. We're here to rise up for a revolution of moral values. We're here to show that we must do more. More mobilizing, more organizing, more registering, more educating people for a movement a movement that protests and sings and votes. And we're here to rise up in 2020 and at the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, June 20, 2020. Yeah, let's, let's hear it for that. And will you say it with me? Mass Poor People's Assembly, Mass Poor People's Assembly. And, moral and Moral March on Washington June 20, 2020 June 20, 2020 Because today, in 2019, in these yet to be United States of America, there are 140 million people who are poor or low income. There are 39 million children. Half of this nation's children don't know where their food will come from. That's in a country that throws out more food than it takes not just to feed every person in this country, but the world all over. We need to rise up. And people are rising up. People are building a moral fusion movement of people from all races and creeds and colors, people from all religions and geographies, states, sexualities, genders. And people are indeed mobilizing and organizing registering and educating. Mobilizing, organizing, registering, educating. Mobilizing, organizing, registering, educating. So the Poor People's Campaign in 2018 organized the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in this country's history more than 40 capitals, and in Washington, D.C. And then we converged on the National Mall for a call to action rally. This past June, we pulled off the Poor People's Moral Action Congress. We held the largest forum with presidential candidates in this election season, posing to those candidates, where do you stand on the issues that impact the 140 million poor and low-income people. We presented a poor people's moral budget to the House Budget Committee. We showed our Congress people we found the money. We found it. We know how we could have universal health care for everybody. We know how everyone could have a living wage job. There's no reason for there to be homelessness. All of our kids could have a great education. Everybody could go to college for free if they wanted to. We showed that it's not that there's scarcity, except for a scarcity of political will. And so now we're touring this nation. We're here right in Kentucky on this We Must Do More tour. We're rising up, saying fight poverty, not the poor. 
say, everybody's got a right to live, saying, somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. Indeed, we're lifting from the bottom. We see everybody rising. So I wanna share with you a little bit of what we are building power to stand for. Because since 2010, at least 23 states have passed racist voter suppression laws. Laws that target black, indigenous, and Latinx voters, target the poor, and allow extremists like Mitch McConnell into office who use their power to hurt us all. So we're rising up for voting rights, for the immediate full restoration and expansion of the Voting Rights Act. We demand an end to racist gerrymandering and redistricting. We demand an end to placing persons on the federal bench who have a record of standing against voting rights, standing against LGBTQ rights, standing against women's rights, standing against everyone's rights. We demand automatic reg voter registration at the age of 18, early voting in every state, same day registration, and the right to vote for the currently and formally incarcerated now. And as we rise up for voting rights, we're rising up for workers' rights. Because even though corporations have unmatched profits, there are 62 million low-wage workers in this nation. There are three individuals who own as much wealth as half of the U.S. population. There isn't a town or a city across this country where if you're working full time and being paid a minimum wage that you can afford a two bedroom apartment. So we are rising up for living wages. We demand a job at a living wage, the right for all workers to form and join unions. We demand equal pay for equal work, guaranteed annual income, we demand fully funded anti-poverty programs that protect the welfare of all. We demand housing programs to ensure that all people have a place to call home. And we know that we can't separate housing and living wages and anti-poverty from the health and well-being of our earth and everyone that's living on it. So we have to demand clean water and clean air. We have to demand public infrastructure. We have to demand single payer, universal health care. And we have to demand the ending of the militarization of our budget. There are 800 military bases around the world. More than 70% of the US government's total greenhouse gas emissions come from the Department of Defense. 50% of kids living on military bases qualify for food stamps. There are 40,000 deaths because of gun violence. So we, demand an end to warmongering. We demand a ban, a ban on assault rifles and a ban on easy access to firearms. We demand that everybody's got a right to live. So we know what we gotta do. We know that we have to rise up. We have to rise up for voting rights. We have to rise up for housing rights. We have to rise up for healthcare rights. We have to rise up for the rights of all to thrive in this society. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up, 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 and build 
the mightiest movement this country has seen. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Organize in Kentucky and meet us in Washington, D.C., June 20, 2020. Rise up. Are we going to rise up? Here to give us some information on why we must do more and why they're joining us in D.C. on June 2020 are two of the tri-chairs from here in Kentucky. Pam McMichael and Serena Owens will come and let us know why they're coming to D.C. next year. Good evening, family. <laughs> Let's mobilize, organize, register, educate, mobilize, organize, register, educate. Amen. Thank you for being here. And first, I have to give honor and all the glory to God. Amen. <laughs> God is good all the time. This is a revival, right? <laughs> Amen. So first, and also I want to thank God for the Poor People's Campaign. I want to thank God for allowing us to have this moral revival here in the Lincoln Grant Scholar House. This was in the early and mid-1900s, the colored school um, up here in northern Kentucky. So it's an honor to be here today. I am also want to thank the Poor People's Campaign for lifting up our voices and for starting, you know, lifting up from the bottom. We greatly appreciate this opportunity to have our voices heard. And thank Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, thank the NAACP, and I thank the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights for recognizing this campaign with an Unbridled Spirit Award, as well as our Covington Mayor and Commissioners for recognizing that today, October the 25th, is the Poor People's Campaign Day, the National Call for More Revival Day. This is the day. <laughs> Amen. So it's testimony time. So anybody in here ever experienced poverty or know someone or love someone who's ever experienced poverty? Anyone ever needed help with groceries or housing, health care, gas to get to work? Anyone ever live paycheck to paycheck or need a bill payment deferment arrangements and still, um, and still have to duck and dodge bill payers in order to make ends meet? Oh, Lord, they're going to see me on TV. <laughs> well, you're not alone. So I'm your sister, Serena, and I'm a mother and a wife of a veteran who's still waiting on some of his benefits. I'm an educator who has seen discrimination and racism, and my chil own children have been attacked in school, and even one of my daughter's special ed teachers has told her that she's her slave driver. Right here in Kentucky, that ain't right. My children have been bullied and attacked by teachers in the school system who were racist against them. Now, they had loving teachers, but this has happened from teachers who were racist against them right here in northern Kentucky. I have, uh, um, I'm also um, a deaconess in my church, and I volunteer in the schools and in, in, the, in our community. I also, um, I'm a community state and a national activist, and I, and, and I was courageous enough with the help of organizations like the Poor People's Campaign and Kentuckians for the Commonwealth and United We Stand, who empowers us to run for office. But I, but I was attacked because I ran for office, just like our judge, uh, Tracy, judge Hun um, Tracy Judge Hunter, was attacked for running for office. This does happen right here in Kentucky and in, in over in Ohio, and that's not right. Okay, so I, um, and, and I want to, um, to allow our, um, our tri-chair to talk about why we're here. I just wanted you to know today that I'm here because organizations like the Poor People's Campaign who allowed us to lift up our voices in front of our governor in the State House 
and Kentuckians for the Commonwealth who empowers us and trains us and to, um, to speak with our legislators has saved lives. They saved the life of my daughter who lost her health care and was put on a waiver waiting list for six years. For six years knowing that she um, was suicidal, knowing that she needed the health care. She was put and she qualified and once had those services. So I just wanted you to know that you're not alone and you have the Poor People's Campaign. We're gonna stand in solidarity with you. We're gonna help lift up your voices. You are not alone, okay? So again, it's testimony time. We have some awesome um, community heroes who were courageous enough to, um, to come forward and share their stories. And Pam, did you want to? Okay. And uh, they were awesome and courageous enough to come and, and share their stories, their testimonies. Uh, and, uh, and we're very grateful for them because when we come forward and when they come forward, that encourages others to not be silent anymore. Amen. So we have uh, three testifiers today. We have Jerry Neri, who will be speaking on ecological devastation, or Senko, about the, uh, the, uh, the pollution in our water and about the Petro uh, Chemical Hub. And it's also a member of the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition. And then we have Richard Addison, who will be speaking on poverty, recovery, and the LGBTQ issues. He's a member of GLASS, the Gay and Lesbian Achieving Sobri Sobriety Together. And then we have Julie Russ, who will also be coming. She she's a high school leader and a youth organizer around climate strike. And she's also a, m a member of the Youth Activist Coalition. Let's give them a hand and lots of love for being courageous and coming here today to share their story. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? June 6th of this year, Orsenko, the Ohio River Valley Sanitation Commission, they decided that they were going to roll back the regulations that had been created that, when enforced, held those industries accountable for the pollution that they put in the Ohio River. As of June 6, 188 of these regulations in six states have disappeared. Ohio Valley and the Ohio River is the most polluted river in the United States for nine years. It is the home to five million people where they get their water. And where I'm from, where the average lifespan of a male, adult male, is 49 years old, where there's a 300% higher rate of birth defect, where there's a 300% higher rate of cancer, because the water is poisoned. I know what this looks like. I know what it looks like when they poison your water. And when they tell you what's safe to drink, you need to talk to somebody from Flint, Michigan. They told them that water was safe to drink too. But we're still here. And it's, when I look at this and I think about the fact that it is egregious that those people who are most affected by these policies are the ones that are held to change them. I look at all of you and I see you standing there. And I remember the youth of my community, the youth of my elders community and what they taught us about standing. And they taught us that we stand with our brothers and our sisters and they taught us that we stand for the water and life. They taught us that we stand for one people in all nations, and I want you all to say that with me. We stand, we stand. for the water, for life. We stand with our brothers and our sisters. We stand for all people, for all nations. We stand for our brothers and our sisters. We stand for water. For life. for life, we stand, we stand. 
for all people, for all nations. We stand. We stand. We stand. Thank you. Richard Addison. And who am I? Well, when it comes to being hurt, I'm a gay African-American male who grew up in the projects of New York City. Mm, mm -mm. I grew up with racism. I grew up poor. I grew up being told by a variety of people that I would not amount to anything because of who I decided to love. My only solution at the time was drugs and alcohol. That led me to homeless shelters, hospitals, rehabilitation centers, on the street corner, sleeping outside on a cardboard box, underneath a bridge, and more attempts of suicide than I can remember. I was broken down. But then I found help, of all places, Kentucky. <laughs> I love my Kentucky family. Now don't get me wrong, I'm always going to be a New York City boy. But I love my Kentucky family. Because I learned in Kentucky that I am not alone. I learned in Kentucky that there are people like me who want a better life, not just for themselves, but for everyone. I found my church family in Covington. And this is not a shameless plug whatsoever, but it happens to be First Christian Church on 5th, 5th Street and Madison Avenue, Pastor Tracy Bertiden. I love my church family. They have given me new life. They've given me new hope. And the Poor People's Campaign Oh, man. Woo. They've given me, y'all given me, a voice. Y'all given me the warrior spirit to stand up to those in Kentucky that might be watching. Hello, Mr. McConnell. Hello, representatives in Ohio and Indiana. And not to, not to spit on any names or anything, but hello, Mr. Person sitting in the White House right now. My name is Richard Addison. I am a gay black male who survived in recovery. I am a fighter, and I will not, I will not be silent anymore. My name is Julie Russ, um, and first of all, I'd like to thank the Poor People's Campaign for inviting me into this beautiful space. Um, it really is incredible to be here, and I'm so grateful. Yeah. Today, I'm going to be talking about gun violence. In our country, this epidemic is our reality. In our streets, in our schools, in our movie theaters, in our shopping malls, the problem of gun violence permeates all aspects of life. When children as young as kindergarten, Children too young to understand it all 
are taught how to take hover in an open shooter situation, it is clear we have a problem. Who could forget the homophobic, hate-fueled attack on the Pulse nightclub? Or the horrific scene at Sandy Hook Elementary School? Or the victims in Aurora, Colorado? Or Mandalay Bay or Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? In our own state of Kentucky, Marshall High School lost students to a shooter a few years ago. Because of this nightmare, because this nightmare is the modern student's reality, obviously something needs to be done. How? Advocacy is one way I've attempted to aid in making that change. I was one of the founding members of the Fort Thomas March for Our Lives chapter, part of the national organization started by Parkland students that is aimed towards gun violence awareness and prevention education, as well as pro-gun control lobbying efforts and voter registration campaigns. Through my work with March for Our Lives, I've learned a lot, and specifically, that gun violence is something people care about. However, one aspect of the epidemic that is often overlooked is gun violence in relation to underprivileged urban communities. How do we address gun violence in our streets, within gangs, amongst minority groups, against minority groups, by both criminals and by those meant to protect? Police brutality and street violence are all too prevalent, and as a white woman, I'm privileged that I have never had reason to fear authority. But that is not true for our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Gun violence against minority groups by police is absolutely abhorrent and indicative of a systematic breakdown. It's certainly a difficult problem to tackle and one that is probably more pressing even than mass shootings. Mass shootings, though of course tragic, life-altering and heinous, are often middle upper class occurrences. Not always, but often. When we talk about gun control, we should not solely focus on this narrative of mass shootings. It is only one facet of the wide scale societal issue with access to guns in this country, including people both in our streets and in uniform. If you're passionate about this topic, I urge you to stand with the movement. Get involved with Moms Demand Action, March for Our Lives, or another one of the amazing gun violence prevention organizations in our area. Advocacy is the path to justice, and that can start anyone, anywhere with anyone, at any age. Thank you so much. Quiet. 
You know it's gone on. Yes, it's gone on. I tell you it's gone on. Oh, if we've been just a little too quiet, you know it's gone on. And we won't be silent anymore. And we won't be silent anymore. And we won't be silent Glad to be here with you all tonight and to be in this historic building where so much went on to help so many people in terms of organizing, looking at the murals around the, the audience, around the walls. I had a chance to meet a cousin. Where is she at? My little Barbara right there. She says she's my cousin. <laughs> And we're glad to uh, heard some of the testimonies, heard Reverend Dr. Liz. Let's give them a big hand for that. I want to be a little solemn tonight for a moment and ask you to look around and think about who's not here. Who's not here? Who's, and, and not so much the politicians. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about of the impacted people. Because this movement is not just about a few of us feeling good about standing up for the poor. If we do that, we failed. It's about the agency of poor and low wealth people standing up for themselves. It's about us joining with them. It's about us making sure we make every accommodation and every facility and everything we do so that the people who are the face of the statistics rise up together with moral leaders, with advocates, with all of us. Now Liz told you what we're on this tour for. We kind of, in this process, <clears throat> are speaking in a tradition they used to call teen preaching in the Pentecostal church. And so one preacher takes one part of a verse and that's all they deal with. They don't go over on the other side. And then the other one deals with the other side. And it becomes a process of community teaching. And then nestled in the midst of that are the testifiers who are the heart and soul, the reason why. And it's important for a movement to have that kind of discipline because this is not just about oratory. It's about teaching. It's about the thousands of people online. It's about the media who comes. And I'm, I'm teaching even now PPC as you all continue to organize the discipline of a movement. Um, you sit down even before you come and you say, I'm going to say this. So you, don't you say that, and I'm going to say this, so it doesn't look like the movement in talking to itself. Because people can pick up. This is not about competition. You know, I went in the room one time, and they said, Rambo, we want you to speak last, because no, it's not about who to speak last and who speaks first. It's about truth. Yeah. It's not about imitation. It's about truth. So Liz told you what we are on this tour for in terms of the vision. And the reason we want to put that out there first of what we are fighting for is because we've done enough. We want to be, people to be clear that things don't have to be this way. There is a vision beyond, right? 
and she's talked to you about what we're going to D.C. for and why we're asking you to nationalize Kentucky, Roz, and build up for and what we are inviting people into the movement for and what we are registering voters for and why is it that every time we get together, we can't be satisfied if we're the only ones that hear it. Every state we're saying now, this is the moment that media is most important. And just to have an internal pep rally is not enough. You can't change the narrative if you're not in the narrative. And you can't change the narrative if you're ever satisfied with just speaking to the choir. Huh. Which means every, you gotta work, everything has gotta work. No, you don't get no do, and I'm not fussing, I'm teaching, y'all hear me tonight. You, everything gotta work. Everything gotta work. You gotta make sure that the media got somewhere to park, because you don't want to give them no excuse to turn around. You got to have what my friend Bob calls redundancy. If you got internet, you got to have three. So you make sure it's not missed. If you're organizing, you got to make sure that you go over every step of the testifiers so that they're not just testifying about something that's kind of general, but themselves. If we're going to change this narrative, the nation has got to hear the deep pain. The goal of the testifiers many times is not to make us applaud, it's to make us cry. And we gotta work on that, y'all. Because the, the tendency is we like celebration, but this nation has to be broken to the point of repentance. And the joy will come, the joy, the joy has to come up through knowing that we're on the right side of history. Not saying we're on a joyous movement, but the joy can never override the tears. This nation has never changed until it was forced on its knees. Until its heart was broken. Until folks saw how ugly it was. And only then. I went to a labor movement meeting one time, I think it was in Chicago, and uh, they were all out there to argue for better wages, but the, the DJ was playing uh, some party song, disco song. And I walked over and said, what are you playing? He said, well, I'm doing music for the movement. I said, that ain't connected to nothing. If, if, if you playing happy music, but then you want to turn around and tell the people you hurting, because you're not getting living wages, you're getting a mixed message. We can't be afraid to cry. The Bible in Amos chapter five says, God says, I need a remnant that will cry in the streets. I don't even need everybody, but I do need some folk who will cry in the street, who will shut down the, 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 the factories, and will shut down the malls. And God says, when I hear you willing to cry, God says, then I'll come and help you. But I can't even help you until I'm serious. I'm, I, I'm, I know that you're serious about needing help. And Kentucky, like a lot of other states, but since we're in Kentucky, we got to help Kentucky cry. As I said, Liz told you what we are building power for. My job tonight is to tell you why. You know what? You know, the budget, the moral budget, and more money for education and cutting the military budget so we can fund these other things. She, she listed it out and we have this moral budget. But my job tonight is to say why. And the reason why is because there is a systematic reality that is literally trying to push us down and destroy us. 
And we must make sure in our gathering that our gatherings start being full of the people that are experiencing that push down every day. Wish I had a witness here. That, that the reality of systematic racism, systematic poverty, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism, not just the false moral narrative, but the false moral narrative of Christian and religious nationalism. And I said this the other night in Louisiana, I'll say it here, is literally trying to kill us. Those five interlocking injustices are like a stranglehold on this democracy. Those five interlocking injustices are trying to kill our hopes, kill our dreams, and literally kill people. She told you what we're going for. Let me tell you why. It's because, yes, there are 140 million people living in poverty, but why we have to go nationalize Kentucky and why Kentucky has to join with all these other states and why we have to go to Washington, D.C. for a, not a march, but a mass poor people's assembly and moral march on Washington is because that 140 represents, 40 million represents 43% of this nation. That ought to make any sane person tremble that in the wealthiest country in the entire world, 43%, four out of every 10 people, plus some, are living in poverty and low income. And a quarter million die every year. 600 a day. I mean, 600 a month. No, 600 a day, isn't it? Am I what I say? 600 a day. Is that right? Or a week? It's a week, I think. It's a week. 600. And yes, we should be moved when 20 some odd people get shot down by white nationalism in El Paso, and then others get shot down in Ohio and Dayton. Oh yeah. But there are people, but, but when we should be in the street, but we also should be in the street when 600 folk, 250,000 a year, 600 folk a week, are dying from poverty. When policy has been turned into a political AK-47. Murder by other means is still murder. 37 million people, somebody pull out your calculator right quick on your phone. 37 million people without health care. A study at Harvard says for every one million people without health care, 5,600 people die. Add that up, 37 million times 5,600. 36 million, 5,600 times 37, 5,600 times 37, what is that? Do it like this, 5,800. We're going to get it right, 5,800 times 37. Yeah. That many people are dying every year. Not because God called them home, but because governors roll back health care. And legislators roll back health care. And we have to get those folk in this room. It's, it's all right to boo the, 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 the politicians, but we got to make America see the folk that's dying. We're going to need some folk coming to, to D.C. who will stand on that stage and say, I might not be with you by August. Because I'm dying from cancer, I'm dying from something, and I would have health care, but in Kentucky they rolled it back. 
and I'm here with the last part of my breath to say fight until that reality is changed. That's, that's why we're going. Four million people get up every morning, can buy unleaded gas, but can't buy unleaded water. And they're drinking unleaded water, not just in Flint. Flint is, the, Flint is, the, is right now the focal point, but even here in Kentucky. 26 states engaging in racist voter suppression. We are a movement that understands our problem didn't start with Trump. We, 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 we're, not that, we're not that shallow as a movement. We understand that six years before Trump's name was ever on the ballot, 26 states decided to suppress the votes of 54% of African Americans in this country. And the very people that suppress the votes, once they get elected, they didn't turn around and pass policies that hurt white folk, black folk, native folk, Latino folk, Asian folk. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm being solemn tonight, but my job is to tell, see my job tonight is to get you a little pissed off. Why? These unjust spots, I went, we went down to El Paso and they were, they were telling us how some children, they had to take their shoelaces from them because they were so traumatized by being in cages, they were using them to hang themselves. And those are the stories we aren't hearing. Mass incarceration is the new, 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 new slavery, especially among poor folk and among African Americans. You, Native Americans are still treated like wards of the state. And their holy lands are stolen. What do, you, what do you think it would be like if somebody right now went on the site of the National Cathedral in Washington DC and said, we're gonna drill for some copper here. They say, no, this is a religious site, but that's what's happening to our Native American brothers and sisters. People are going on their holy lands where their grandmothers and great-grandmothers and grandfathers are buried and saying to hell with their bones. That's why. And that's why we have to take every gathering so seriously. That's why we gotta work so hard, not just to make sure that I'm in the place, but to make sure that the people impacted are in the space. Now that's, that's, that's not, and I'm not even talking about Kentucky yet. Why must we do this? Cause, cause almost 50% of the people in Kentucky are poor and low well. Hmm? Two million folk, almost 60% of the children Somewhere we got to have a movement in Kentucky that says to our white brothers and sisters, y'all better stop, y'all better stop believing them damn lies about racism. Y'all better stop letting folks separate you from black people. Because the reality is there are 1.6 million white poor folk in Kentucky. There ain't but 435 poor black folk in Kentucky. Now that's 65% people of color. But that's 1.2 million less than poor, low-income white folk. And I believe if we tell the truth, we can cut through the divisions that have so long separated us. But we gotta get folk in the same room. Somebody asked us, well, we crazy to go down, we going to what, Hazard County? We say, yeah, we crazy. <laughs> crazy enough to believe that it's foolish to think America has to live like this. Yeah. Yeah. You're right here, right here in this state. You've heard some of the stats. And behind this, we got a, somebody shout real people. real people. 271 people uninsured say real people. Real people. That means that about a thousand people died last year in Kentucky that God ain't had nothing to do with calling them home. Yeah. Now God may have welcomed them home, but a thousand of them died because the politicians in this state, like McConnell, your other senator, your governor, and other folk, when they got elected, they get free health care that you pay for, but then they don't want the people that elected them to have the same thing. And every gathering we have like this, we gotta start bringing in the people impacted. Yeah. Yeah. The people that live in those 33 
census tracts in Kentucky that can't afford water. The people that are affected by the 87 tons of, of nitrogen oxide that's emitted in Kentucky. The 4,000 people that are homeless. The people who work at a minimum wage and they got to work 77 hours just to afford a two-bedroom apartment. The 872,000 people in this state that make under $15 an hour. That's why. We know what we want, but we have to know why. 50% of the workers in this state make less than a living wage. While your senator has raised his salary every time they've done it. Huh? Huh? 636,000 people participate in food stamps. 52% of us Os Osweiler, O-W-S, L-E-Y, I say it. Help me, Kentucky. Yeah, Ausley County, 52% our own 52% uh, of, the, of the county residents, 94% that are white receive food stamps. And we got to have some white poor folk that will stand up and say to these politicians and others, you're going to stop talking about poverty like it's just a people of color issue and using that as a wedge issue to separate us from each other. And Kentucky can do it because there's a second reason why we wanted to come to Kentucky in the early months because we wanted to be inspired by the history of Kentucky because Kentucky is a place where before the Civil War black and white folk found their way together hmm? before the Civil War there was the reality of slavery trying to push people down. And what did they do here in Kentucky and across the river? You birth abolitionists. White abolitionists who worked with slaves and free blacks. And they came together, not in the 1900s, but in the 1800s. Before the end of the, before the beginning of the Civil War, when it was much more dangerous, and if they could get slaves and white folk together before the Civil War, surely. If they could get the impacted people together before the Civil War, with those who were willing on to take on the oppressors that looked like them, that's the history here. In 1840s, when there wasn't even looked like there wasn't even any hope of ending slavery, Levi Coffin of Cincinnati helped more than 3,000 slaves escape their masters and gain freedom in Canada. Coffin was a Quaker, and his name became president of the Underground Railroad. In Ripley, I saw somebody say, mm-hmm. <laughs> Am I in your history? Yeah. A Presbyterian minister named John Rankin served as the conductor and opened his home to African Americans. This is 1840s, y'all. Huh? Folk were getting together and refusing to be pushed down. His home stood on a 300-foot high hill that overlooked the Ohio River. As uh, Rankin would single the fugitive slaves in Kentucky with a lantern and let them know when it was safe for them to cross the Ohio River. And then they came up with a rule that you had to get halfway across because if, if they caught you before you were halfway across the Ohio River, you were still considered a slave. So he provided them with shelter and he hid them and then John Park, a Rankin's neighbor, am I talking right? Uh, he brought hundreds of fugitives from slavery across the Ohio River in a boat. 
We got cars with GPS. You know doggone well if they could get slaves across the river with a boat, we can get to DC with all these cars and trains and airplanes. And Now, these men risked their lives. If, if, if this was 1840, by now somebody would have been in here shooting us up. Or trying to. This was 1840s, and they risked their lives, white folk, to assist African Americans and black and white people who understood long before Dr. King that their reality was inextricably bound to one another. And the history tells us that people from Covington, Kentucky, rose up together and shuttled slaves across the river. People from here rose up together and they refused to be pushed down. I believe that same spirit is still in Kentucky. My God, I, I believe, I believe, I believe Yara, I feel the spirit of the ancestors. Huh? I hear, I hear what Paul said in the book of Hebrews that when you run the right way, there's a great cloud of witnesses. Huh? They might be dead, but they ain't dead, dead. They still alive in the upper echelons of heaven and they're looking down on us, cheering us as we fight on against the oppression of our day. I feel the spirit in here. And since I'm a preacher, let me close with this story. Not only did I want to tell you the story of why from the perspective of the pain, and not only did I want to tell you the story of why from the perspective of the past, I want to tell you why from the perspective of the profound reality of Scripture. And that is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, Paul wrote something that, that is like a touchstone for me and has been one down through the years. The people were facing all kind of trouble and Caesars and folk like Trump back then who wanted to always push people down and hurt people and lie and build big buildings and put their names on it while they crushed the lives of people. And, and, and for a moment, my brother, the people thought about quitting. The people thought about shrinking back. The people thought about, you know, just slumping down and just giving up and putting their head between their legs and just, just, just not engaging. And then Paul comes along and said, but wait a minute. The just shall live by faith. In other words, justice folk got to have some faith. Justice folk have to believe things can change. Justice folk have to believe that it ain't over till God says it's over. Justice folk have got to believe that if the sun gets up in the morning, you can get up in the morning. Justice folk have to get up every morning, not because your alarm clock wakes you up, but because purpose gets you up out of the bed. The just shall live by faith. And then after Paul said to just live by faith, he then said, now we are not of those who shrink back under destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not, not seen. Turn to your neighbor first and say, we have to know who we are. I'm sick and tired right about now of everybody keep telling us who Trump is. We know who he is. I'm about tired of everybody telling us who McConnell is. We know who he is. I'm about tired of everybody telling us who the racists are. We know who they are. But the question is, who are we? Whose children are we? Are we the children of the liberators? Are we the children of the overcomers? Are we the children of the abolitionists? Are we the children of the people who walk by faith in the past? We are not of those, touch your neighbor and say, we are not of those who shrink back. Look at them, look at them real good say, we are not of those who shrink back, who get scared, who give up, who fall down, who quit. No! We are those who rise up together. We are those who rise up for the salvation of the soul of this nation. While we're going to D.C., it's time to rise up. No time for shrinking. 
No time for sitting down. No time for giving up. We've got power that's untapped. Do you know that the number of people that are poor and low wealth in Kentucky is the margin of victory in this state? That if you organize 10% of the poor and low income people in this state, you can change any election. This ain't no time to shrink. It's time to rise up. Do you know that a hundred million people didn't vote in the last election? And that's because they didn't hear anything about poverty and low wealth. And if we can change the moral narrative, maybe a 50 million of that hundred million might decide to return to the civic square. This ain't no time to shrink back. It's time to rise up. Do you not realize that the people before us face worse than this? Stop acting like this is the worst thing we ever seen. We come from people who overcame slavery. We come from people who overcame the denial of women to vote. We come from people that overcame Jim Crow. We come from people that overcame all kinds of evil. This ain't new, it's just our time to rise up together and know who we are. We are not those who shrink back unto destruction, but it's time to rise up together and shake the foundation of Washington, D.C. Somebody said, why are y'all going on June 20th, 2020? Well, why go after the conventions? After they made their decisions, after they've had their votes, we're going in June to put our agenda on the table. We're going in June to show the face of the hurting and the sick and the broken in this country. We're going in June, cause we're expecting July, August, September, October, November, December, that there's gonna be a change in this country if we have anything to do with it. Is there anybody here ready to rise up together? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is my help. I'm not going to let you shrink. Grab him by the arm and say, get up and let's fight together. Let's stand together. Let's protest together. Let's march together. Let's pray together. Let's vote together. But for God's sake, don't sit down together. We are not of those who shrink back unto destruction. We are those who, who, who press on unto the salvation of the soul of this nation. I wonder tonight, is there anybody else that feels the spirit of the ancestors? Let me see if I can, like my Quaker brothers and sisters, just take a moment and look up in the atmosphere and see if for a moment we can't hear them crying over the balconies of divinity. Don't y'all quit. Don't y'all stop. Y'all better keep on fighting. We fought before you were born and we overcame a whole lot of things before you were born. And so you better rise up together and take your place because I'd rather rise up together and lose than sit down and never make a chance at trying to make things different. But I know what history says. When we rise up together, we win. One can chase a thousand. Two can put 10,000 to flight. If God be for us, it doesn't matter who is against us. We have been may endure for a night, Kentucky, but joy will come in the morning. Rise up together. Now, while you're standing, who's going to work hard to get some more people? that are impacted, come on, come on. It's gonna take it. Who's gonna help nationalize Kentucky and make sure that when DC happens, Kentucky is represented in all of her beauty and all of her power and all of her diversity. Come on, you can play some, who's gonna do that? Who has tonight text or sent out a message that you're here tonight? Huh? All right. Who has signed up the forms so that we got your emails? Who has signed up for 90975 and text Morrow? Okay, take a seat, take a seat, take a seat. Open your phones, 
open your phones. And if you can't open it, then get a young person to open it and give them $5. Because they know your password and everything. Come on. Come on. Come on. Open your phone and text nine, oh, text Mara, the word Mara, M-O-R-A-L. Text the word Mara, M-O-R-A-L, to 909-75. Come on, 909-75. How many of you turned in your form tonight? Raise your hand. Okay, that's about three, one third. We don't need, we, please don't leave. Even if you're a spy, fill out a form. We want you to change, we believe. We're gonna rise up till you change. That's right. We're gonna, you're gonna find I told the policeman today, no need to arrest us. McConnell don't want you to have a living wage. <laughs> you better be marching with us. Huh? Who needs a form? Who needs a form? Raise your hand. 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 How many of y'all got friends in other states? Oh, it's a pitiful crowd. Y'all don't have no friends. How many of y'all got friends in other states? You need to text them and call them. We need you to push out the whole schedule for the We Must Do More. Mobilizing, organizing, registering, educating people for the movement who vote. Push it out. Push it out. Push it out. Push it out. Brothers and sisters, it's just our time. I tell this everywhere I go. Everybody's got gray hair. Raise your hand. It's your time. You got to suit up one more time. That's why the Lord let you live with all that pretty gray hair. You got to. How many of you are in that 35 to 50 crowd? We got to pay dues now. Because we've been living off the sacrifices of other people. Time for us to pay some dues now. How many of you are 30 and under? Okay. It's just time. It's time for you to do what you got to do. You're young. It's time to do it. But everybody's got to do it because there's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. And, and y'all know we don't need everybody. We need somebody together. 140 million. What if, if two million? You know how we get to two million? We need every pe poor people's campaign state committee to reach out and connect 30,000 people on Facebook and on media, social media. 30,000 plus 43 is almost 2 million people. I mean 30,000 times 43 is almost 2 million people. That's what we need to happen. We need to connect, y'all. We need to connect and bring people in and commit ourselves to a long-term movement, not just to next year's election. Surely we're going to be engaged, but we're going to be engaged with an agenda of transformation and change. And if folk didn't know your power, they wouldn't be fighting so hard against us. You know, if people didn't know your power, they wouldn't be lying and cheating with voter suppression and going and getting help from Russia and spending so much money to divide people and put out all this false religious narrative. And Liz will tell you, if they, if they, people don't fight you that hard when you're weak. They fight you when you have the potential to rise up together. And what the fight is, is the attempt to make you doubt yourself. That's why the Apostle Paul in that moment had to speak to the people. They had seen crucifixion, they had seen death, but he said, look, we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction. There is a place, and I'm closing. Shh, in the hall, shh, shh, shh. Just play under me, play under me, come on. There is a place, hear me now. There is a place when your nation is acting insane there's a place when your nation is going through serious schizophrenia seeing one thing on paper and doing another in, in public and in private that you cannot help that nation if you don't know who you are 
there's a certain sanity you must have in order to help an insane nation. And you have to decide whose imagination are you going to believe? Whose truth? Are you going to have to believe those who imagine this, this democracy divided, torn apart forever? Or are you going to step in like those of the past who had to imagine the day against awful midnights? They had to imagine the day in midst of awful midnight. They did not go around the midnights. They did not deny the midnights but they had to imagine the day in the midst of the midnights in order to fight through the midnight until the morning. We are not of those who shrink back unto destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. Let's have some faith that what you see here is just the substance of things hoped for. And this gathering tonight is just the evidence of what has not yet been seen in Washington, D.C. and around the world. Liz is going to close us. God bless you. Kentucky folk, God bless you. God bless you. I know it's late, and I know you're tired. But we're gonna end this. And we're gonna rock your stuff out of here as you go out of here. My name is Tana Fogel. I'm out of Lexington, Kentucky. I am one of your tri chairs for the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign. My name's Pam McMichael. I'm out of Louisville with Tana and some other folks. I'm one of the tri chairs of the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign. Fortana closes us out with a call to action. On behalf of the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign, we want to thank Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz and all the national staff for coming to Kentucky once again, joining our efforts as part of a national movement. From Benham, from Bowling Green to Benham, Kentucky, from Hopkinsville to Hazard, from Eddyville to Covington, Louisville, Lexington, Georgetown, and other places in between. Tomorrow we're in Corbin, tomorrow night in Hazard, Kentucky, and Monday night we wrap up this We Must Do More tour in Georgetown, Kentucky, right down the road on 75. Come on down and join us Monday night at Georgetown College for a march that lines up at 5.30, steps off at 6, and a mass meeting like this is 6.30. We wanna say one more reason to Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz and the national folks about why we're in Covington, Kentucky and why we wanted to start this tour here. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the highest percentage of white supremacy groups in Kentucky are right here in this area. And it's important to name that. It's also important to name that so many of our policies, and this has been said tonight, are race-based but hurt all of us. Yes. And it's important to counter that racism head on. When Reverend Barber talked about pain, thank you, Pam. When Reverend Barber talked about pain, one of, one of um, the issues here in Kentucky is that over 312,000 Kentuckians, like myself, has lost the right to vote. Let me say that number again. 312,000, and it takes an order from our governor in order to give us a partial pardon. I want you to sit with that. And so that's why that petition is floating out there from the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth to get you to sign and support the people that are back in the community working, we need to vote. And you think about changing Kentucky, over 312,000 will change it. So as we close, we would like to thank the planning team from the Northern Kentucky area 
We would like for the planning team to please come up and surround us. Thank you, Danielle, our regional leaders. But here's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna go 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20